Welcome to Hearing God's Voice. In today's message, God Talked with Jacob, Dr. McLuhan shares how the presence of God rescued Jacob from a life of running and strife. The more we learn about Jacob, the more surprising it is to discover that God talked to him. God was willing to talk to Jacob. He will talk to you. There should be no doubt in your mind about that. Uh, Jacob's mother, Rebekah, had been married to Isaac for more than 20 years before she was able to conceive children. The Bible tells us his, her husband prayed for her and God opened her womb. Her pregnancy was difficult. It felt to her like there was a fight going on in her womb. and She asked God to explain to her why she felt this struggle within her body. This is what the Lord said to her, stunning words. Two nations are in your womb. Two people are within you whom will be divided. One will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. Genesis chapter 25, verse 23. What stunning words these are. <clears throat> Unless Rebecca was able to say, God said that to me, I doubt that anyone would have believed her. The battle she felt in her womb is still being seen and felt around the world today. It is remarkable that God released to a first-time mother the geopolitical roots, root issues that we are facing in the world this very day. The revelation given to Rebecca was as deep as the revelation that God gave to Mary. I believe that there are mothers listening today to this message to whom God has spoken. Do what Rebecca and Mary did. Ponder these things in your heart and wait for God's timing to lead you. God will let you know when it's time to share publicly what he has said to you in private. In time, Rebecca gave birth to twins and she named the firstborn Esau and the secondborn Jacob. Now, these boys grew to be men of destiny that shaped the ancient world, and yet their relationship was always tense. Now, Jacob is mentioned over 300 times in the Bible, and Yaqub, Arabic for Jacob, is only mentioned 16 times in the Quran. I was in Africa one time, and a bishop shared this insight with me on the story. He said, in, in Africa, it's common for fathers to love the firstborn, and for mothers to love their last born. It certainly was the case in this story. The Bible tells us that Isaac loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Now the first serious tension between these young men surfaced when Esau came home from hunting, hungry, thirsty, and tired. Remember those three words. Uh, Jacob had just finished cooking a delicious meal, and when Esau asked for food to eat, Jacob said, the price for this meal that Esau you need to pay is to give me your birthright. Just stunning. What a stunning question. Well, what is a birthright? You may be familiar with the expression wanting to have a double portion of someone's anointing. And that idea grew out of the firstborn son's inheritance. For example, if there were four sons in a family, then the inheritance would be divided by five, and the oldest would get two portions, and the rest would get one portion. So the first portion in the case of Isaac and Jacob uh, was that uh, now, after this event, uh, Jacob was going to receive two portions of the three, and Isaac would only receive one. Uh, so he received the double portion. This was Esau's response. Thus, Esau despised his birthright. Genesis chapter 25 and verse 34. What a tragic sentence it is. There's great value in honoring the inheritance that the Lord has for us to walk in. Many people have traded away their true spiritual inheritance for the things of this world. Now, on a practical note, do not make major life decisions when you are hungry, thirsty, and tired, you most likely won't make the right decision. Uh, Jesus himself warned us about this kind of foolishness. 
This is what he taught his disciples. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. The next tension that arose between Jacob and Esau happened when it came time for Isaac to bless his sons. It did not mean that Isaac was about to die. Indeed, he was going to live on for another 20 or 30 years. But when sons came of age, it was the typical practice of the patriarchs to bless their sons. And when Rebekah heard that Isaac was about to give Esau his blessing, she devised a plan to trick her husband into giving his blessing to Jacob and not to Esau. This is a very sad chapter in the life of this family. The details of this event, uh, these events can be found in Genesis chapter 27. I encourage you to read further on your own this week. So Isaac asked Esau to hunt for game and to prepare him one of his favorite meals and come and serve it to his dad. You can see how the excitement was building and all the anticipation for that moment. Uh, Rebecca, however, quickly called Jacob, instructed her, him to bring to her one of the choice goats out of the flock, and she began to fix what she knew to be Isaac's uh, favorite meal. And she gave Jacob one of Esau's robes to wear so that when Isaac leaned on his son, he would smell the field and the forest that was in Esau's clothes. Now, all of this worked because by then Isaac was blind. And Isaac released a powerful blessing on Jacob that ended with these words. Let people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers, and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you, and blessed be everyone who blesses you. Genesis chapter 27, verse 29. Now, no sooner had Isaac finished saying these words than Esau came hurriedly into the tent of his father, and he learned that his blessing had been stolen. The Bible tells us that Esau wept bitterly. Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, the days of my mourning for my father are approaching, and then I will kill my brother Jacob. Genesis chapter 22, verse 41. As I said, these are very sad days in the life of this family. Now, you can be sure that Rebecca was listening closely to Esau's words and what was going on in the tent. She quickly arranged for Jacob to visit her father's house in Haran and to keep Esau from killing him, she sent him away. This is a difficult story to understand. One thing that we can appreciate about the Bible is that it tells us the truth about the strengths and weaknesses of the key characters in the story. There's so many people have fictionalized history about characters that are just not true. And the Bible tells the truth, the good and the bad. Now here is an important lesson to learn from the story. If you have a clear word from God, just do like Rebecca did. God is not, uh, don't do what Rebecca did. God is not asking you to make your own strategy to make this word come about. We received many prophetic words over our life, and sometimes there's a tendency to, well, what can I do to make that happen? Resist the urge to do that, because if God gives you a word, treasure it, and he will bring it about. He is asking for your humble obedience step by step as he fulfills his word in ways that you could not ever imagine. That's why trying to figure out what God's going to do never works, because he does it in ways we don't expect. So Rebecca enticed her son to do the wrong thing. Moms, don't entice your sons to do the wrong thing. <laughs> she is not a good example to us. Uh, when we wait on God, his plans come to us with less heartache and anxiety. Whatever you're feeling anxious about, just trust God. He has the solution for the problems that you are facing. 
So I sense some people listening to this message are pushing with all of their strength to bring about something that God has promised to do for you. Let the push go. Stop pushing and trust God. Rebecca pushed Jacob into a period of life when he would run and manipulate circumstances for the next 20 years. If you asked him if he should do that again, I'm sure he'd say, I'd have done it a whole lot differently. Many people are trying to force what they believe is the will of God for their life or for the causes that they represent today. God does not need your help. If you wait patiently for him, he will bring about the good plans that he has for you in his own time. We are to walk by faith, following Father God's day-by-day instructions and not devise our own independent ways. The Bible says that in spite of all of the things that went wrong in this story, despite the parents, Esau just went off the rail. He married Canaanite and Hittite woman who made Rebecca's life miserable. It's not good when you make your mother-in-law miserable, gentlemen. Getting ahead of God's ways always brings unnecessary misery into our lives. Rebecca had to wait 20 years for Jacob to return home and with his wives that he had married and with grandchildren that she had longed to always hold in her arms. So I say it again. Resist the urge to pressure God to fulfill his promise to you before he is ready to do so. Yet in spite of all of this heartache, God still had an important role for Jacob to play in the course of history. So Jacob left his family at Beersheba in the south of Israel and traveled north over 100, 500 miles to the town of Haran where Abraham was from and his family. And as the sun went down, he set up a camp near a town that was known in those days as Luz, L-U-Z. As he slept, he had a vivid dream of a ladder reaching down from heaven to where he slept. And as he looked up, he saw angels ascending and descending on this ladder. What an incredible dream. At the top of the ladder, he saw God himself. And this is what God said to him. I am the Lord, capital L-O-R-D. Notice that, the most sacred name for God. The God of Abraham, your father, the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. Genesis chapter 28 and verse 13. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. And in you and in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Genesis chapter 28 and verse 15. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go. And bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I promised you. What a remarkable sentence. If God brings you a promise, if God makes you a promise, God has the ability, without your help, to bring into your life the promise he has made to you. Jacob woke up from this dream. He was shaken by what he saw How'd you like to have a dream like that and get all these words from God and you say, who me? All the key characters of the Bible, that was their first response. God, I don't believe that. This is what Jacob said. Surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. Genesis chapter 28, verse 14. How often it is that God is right next to you and me and we're not even aware of it that God would open our eyes, our heart, and eyes of our mind to see that God is with us. He's with you right now as you came to church today. He's actually sitting in the seat right next to you. God is in this place, and may we have minds and hearts to be in tune with his presence with us. The Bible tells us that Jacob became afraid and renamed the place Bethel, saying this is none other in the house of God, Beth, house, El, God, house of God. Every follower of Jesus needs to have a Bethel experience. In 1985 to 19, from 1985 to 
from 1980 to 1985, I spent five years running from God and from his call upon my life. And when it finally dawned on me that I could not run from the Lord anymore, I was in the historic community of Ghent in downtown Norfolk. And right before me was a beautiful stone church. You may know it well, Christ and St. Luke's Lutheran Church. I saw the church. It was open for prayer. I went in and found a pew in the back and, and just surrendered my life back to the Lord. And that was almost 40 years ago to the day. Uh, six months later, I was called to be your pastor. And when I face difficult circumstances and decisions that I need to make, I go back to my Bethel, Christ and St. Luke's Church, and remind myself that it was at this place that God called me to walk in his will and in his ways and remind myself that as he's helped me these 40 years, he will continue to help me in all the decisions that I face in life. Now, a number of years ago, I was uh, invited by a professor of Islamic interpretation to study the Bible with him. What an unusual opportunity it was. And he wanted me to have his Islamic perspective on the book of Joshua as we were studying together. Uh, as uh, we studied, we came to the capture of the city of Ai and uh, Bethel. And as we talked about Bethel, this Islamic professor began to cry. He said to me, where is Bethel? Where is this house of God? I want to go and visit that place and, and have an encounter with this God. And what the professor did not understand is that Bethel is not only a physical place where people go to this day, but it is a powerful encounter with God. Bethel can be right here, right now. Bethel is when heaven comes down and you have an encounter with God. You don't have to go to Bethel because Bethel will come to you. I'm sure there are plenty of people in this room who've had a, their own Bethel encounter. You've shared your stories with me. Uh, this is exactly what Jesus did for Nathaniel. Philip found Nathaniel, remember, in John chapter 1, and introduced him to Jesus. And Nathaniel's skepticism surfaced when he asked Jesus, how do you know me? And you remember that Jesus said to him, before Philip called you, I saw you when you were sitting under your fig tree, and I saw you there. Of course, Nathan was completely stunned. Nathaniel was completely stunned. But Jesus went on to go further than that, and this is what he said. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. John chapter 1 and verse 51 in this statement, Jesus identified himself as the one whom Jacob saw at the top of the ladder. And no matter where we are, how far we have run, at any moment, Father God can drop a ladder down from heaven and connect with you. It could be that last night you had a dream or a vision in which you saw a man in shining bright clothes, he spoke to you and invited you to follow him. And today, you are listening to this message. It's no accident. It's a divine connection. Father God's dropped a ladder into your life today. Jacob needed this encounter with God. And perhaps just like Jacob, you have made a mess of your life and are trying to run away from the problems that you have created. But last night, God reached down to you and connected with you from heaven. And notice that while there were angels going up and down that ladder, it was not the angels who spoke to Jacob, but it was God himself who spoke to Jacob. Last night in your dream, it was not an angel who spoke to you. It was the man in the shining robe. This is the shining one who appeared before Paul on the road to Damascus. Paul cried out, Who are you, Lord? That's a good thing to cry out when God drops a ladder. Just say, who are you, Lord? And the one in shining clothes said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. 
could be that you've been persecuting followers of Jesus in your country. It could be that you have cheated people just like Jacob did. And today is your day to stop running. Today is your day to give God control of your life. Admit that you are a sinner, accept that Jesus died for you on the cross. Ask him to forgive you for all the sins that you have committed. Say with me, Jesus, thank you for reaching down from heaven into my life. Thank you for revealing yourself to me today. I ask you to save me right now. You just receive Jesus as your Savior. Write to me and tell me about your decision to follow Jesus. Now, perhaps you are already a follower of Jesus, but like me, you've been running away from your calling. God has spoken to you repeatedly, and so far you have resisted. I invite you to surrender your life back to Jesus. It's the best decision you will ever make. God is big enough to move you from where you are to what he has called you to do. Father God, speak to everyone whose heart you have opened to follow you more closely today in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father God, that you have a meaningful purpose for my life. I admit I've made efforts that, apart from you, trying to make my life feel significant. I surrender my life and my choices to you today. Thank you for forgiveness and a new life as a blessing of faith. In Jesus' name, amen. We hope this message has filled you with living hope in Jesus. If you would like to talk to someone about your spiritual journey, please leave a comment or send us a private message. We enjoy reading your notes and having an opportunity to pray with you. If you received a blessing through this message, please share it with others. We invite you to become a Living Hope Partner by donating as little as a dollar a month through our QR code. Your gifts will help us create new messages and reach more people. Living Hope is a ministry of Ingleside International Incorporated. All donations for Living Hope qualify as a charitable contribution. Thank you for your prayers and support. Next week, we will continue learning together from the Word of God. God bless you and fill you with living hope.